Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord, whose love has no limits and whose grace knows no measure, whose powers have no boundaries and that are known unto men. It's out of the Lord's infinite riches in Christ Jesus that he gives and gives and gives again. Uh, this morning, I want to share with you uh, from the message, the Lord's Supper, as we begin to take a look at this great ordinance of the church and um, bring some light and insight into why it is that in just a few moments, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And as we do that, I want you to focus on the tremendous sacrifice and the gift of grace uh, that the Lord has made by the supper that we will partake of in just a few moments. But first, uh, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you gave your body and your blood and that all of us who partake of it may be binded together with you in holy uh, communion. And God, we thank, that, thank you that you have sealed the promise. The covenant has been renewed. Our faith has been vindicated. Our faith is proved. And God, we thank you that even now you are honoring the covenant uh, that you made, that you would keep us in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, and that whosoever will call upon your name will be saved. We thank you that you honor the covenant that you have made, and as we renew our covenant today, we thank you that even now you will honor the renewal. Lord, I pray for the callous and the unconcerned. I pray for those who are suffering with whatever afflictions. I pray for those who are bereaved, a lost one, a loved one who has crossed over uh, from time into eternity. God, I pray now that you will heal those who are sick, that you will mend the broken, and that you will lift the fallen, and that you will do it all in the wonderful name of Jesus, that you will cause peace throughout the land, that you will build upon our altars, uh, upon our hearts an altar, where we forever will be a sacrifice of praise. God, I pray that you will keep us close to you as these days and nights Close with so much uncertainty, one thing is certain, that forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Bless the word, we pray, that we might on, not only be hearers, but doers of the word. And God, I pray that if there's anything I have failed to ask, you don't fail to grant. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we honestly pray, amen. My brothers and sisters, I want to draw your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we'll begin reading in just a moment at verse 20 and make our way all the way down to verse 28. And our focus text, our key text, will be verses 24 and 25. And I uh, want to talk this morning briefly about the Lord's Supper. Um, it is something that all of us have become accustomed to doing it ever since we've been in the church. But the Lord's Supper also is one of those things that many of us practice just as a ritual without understanding that there is a deep and a significant reason to doing it, and not only doing it, but doing it the way that we do it. There's a scriptural basis for what we do and the manner in which we do it. And so I remember when I was very young, um, we always celebrated the Lord's Supper on the first Sunday as we do here at our church. Um, but I never really truly understood why, we, why we're doing it other than the fact that it's something that uh, must be done. It is my deep hope um, that after today's message, there'll be some, some insight and some light shown into why we participate in the Lord's Supper. And those of us in this church, we know that we do celebrate two ordinances, Holy Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And we know that these are two things that our Lord did command that we should do. And so with that in mind, I want to draw your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And what you're about to hear in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is the Apostle Paul um, recounting what is also told in the first three Gospels of the Bible in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, the same story is being told. But here the Apostle Paul is sharing it in this way, and I'm lifting up this way because it provides a context. 
The Lord's Supper did not just happen in a vacuum. It provides a context for why it happened and why we do it. So here's what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 20. And he's speaking to the church. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So let me pause for a moment because we know that we've heard it referred to by many names. And here's going to be the first time that you're going to see in Scripture it being referred to as the Lord's Supper. In verse 21, Paul is still writing, For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. And one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord, which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood, the body and the blood of the Lord. In verse 28, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. And so my brothers and sisters mindful that as the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church which at that time were experiencing so much infighting and so many quarrels and divisions. And, um, and he's writing this letter, this epistle, to give them some sense of the sacred solemnity that must take place when they come together for the Lord's Supper. And so you and I are clear in our understanding that the Lord's Supper um, is not child's play. It is one of the highest and most significant moments in the Christian church. Um, it's not to be um, taken lightly or taken for granted. So much so that uh, as the Apostle Paul is instructing them, um, he's telling them that if you are coming to partake of the bread and the wine for any other reason than a high, holy, and sacred reason, stay home. If you're hungry, stay home. If it's for show, form, or fashion, stay home. Because he tells them what we are about to do is engage God in a sacred moment of communal interaction. And so my brothers and sisters, he's inviting them to a deeper awareness of the relationship in Christ Jesus. And Jesus is the focus of the communion. No one in history has ever had a greater impact than Jesus. This Jesus that he is inviting them to partake of. This Jesus had healed the sick and raised the dead, caused the lame to walk and the blind to see. He's inviting them into a deeper relationship that is only found in the covenant a covenant made by God, sealed by the blood of Christ. And so this communion is not taking place in a vacuum. A lot had gone on. Jesus had been out performing all kinds of miracles. He had gone out teaching the truth that has stood the test of the ages. He comforted the comfortless and discomforted those who had become too comfortable. He made the first 
last and the last first and told the meek they shall inherit the earth. He called the exiles back home and gave them a seat at the table of heavenly citizenship. He'd been out doing good. He'd been lifting the poor into a princely place of peace with a kingly master. He'd been out telling men and women that the wages of sin is still death, but, but, but they have a precious unmerited gift of God, which is eternal life. Many were drawn to this message. That's what he was doing. He, many were drawn to his message. Many followed him, but there were some who despised him and eventually plotted to kill him. And so the scene and the setting of this supper takes place in the background of tremendous grace and good with death and suffering in view. What had gone on the previous three years of Jesus' life, he spent three years from the age of 30 to the age of 33, three years in public ministry. And in those three years, he accomplished more than any man ever has accomplished. That's in the background. What's in the foreground is death and suffering, but what is in the present is the last 24 hours. And it was in the last 24 hours that it all begins to take shape and meaning that this Jesus, who with 12 men launched a movement that changed the world, engaged in radical transformation. He engaged in liberal love and conservative judgment and a gracious will. But in the last 24 hours, he would demonstrate amazing pity and love beyond degree. In those last 24 hours, he would prove that there is no friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not one, no, not one. It was the last 20, not just the first three, but the last 24 hours. The Prince of Glory, the Root of Dabri, the Seed of Abraham, the Lion of Judah, the Great I Am, will prove that there exists a pathway from earth to glory for all who not only would live in the fellowship of his love, but also in the fellowship of his suffering, they sat down at that table. And first of all, uh, let's deal with the terminology. Uh, many people refer to it as the Holy Communion. And some call it the Lord's Supper. Um, the early church and the Catholic church referred to it as the Holy Eucharist and still do. By whatever name they sat down at that table, there is good scriptural basis for each of them in 1 Corinthians 10 and 21, it is called the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 16, Holy Communion, the cup of blessing. In Acts 2 and 42, the breaking of bread by whatever name. What is significant is the act and what it represents. So then first, what is the purpose of the Lord's suffering? I really wish someone had told me this many many years ago because there is a deeper meaning of why we are going to do in just a moment what it is that we will be doing and we do the first Sunday and it's more, it's more, it's more than a ritual. What is the purpose? First, to commemorate the death of Christ. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me, you continue a perpetual and everlasting memory of me. If you look at our table and the table of every Christian church where we place our communion on, you'll find these words, this do in remembrance of me. The act of communion is our way of commemorating the precious gift and the sacrifice made by Jesus. Secondly, to signify, to seal, and apply to all believers the benefits of the new covenant. Now, let's say, God is a covenant keeper. And you know, 
Um, throughout the Bible, you find where God engaged in covenant, he gives a sign. For instance, if you recall um, Noah, after the great flood, God gave a sign. Now the covenant did not change. The covenant, God promised no more flood fire next time, as James Baldwin recounts. And so God sends a sign. The Mosaic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, God always gave a sign. The sign just signifies that God understands the covenant and God will honor the covenant. And in the communion, it represents a new covenant. Because in the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and goats were given as a sacrifice to atone for the sins of men and women. That's what atonement means. At one meant it was a sacrificial lamb brought to the altar. And it had to be a blameless lamb, a perfect lamb, one without spot or one without blemish. It had to be a lamb that was fully sufficient to represent one capable of taking all the sins of the community and placing it on that lamb, which is where we get the word scapegoat, and place all of our sins on that lamb. That was in the old covenant. So now, in the New Testament, Christ becomes the new covenant. He is the sacrificial lamb. In fact, he is our pastoral lamb in the Old Testament, whereas it was a young lamb, an unspotted Jesus, as John declared, is the lamb of God, the only perfect and sufficient sacrifice to atone for the sins of the whole world. And so when God sends his only begotten son, Jesus, to come down here, it is not just to live amongst us, but to die for us. And in dying, the covenant is sealed that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. That is the covenant that God will save those who believe that is the covenant. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, the covenant has not changed. We renew the covenant. And the blood and the body of Christ is a reminder of the covenant. We become partakers of the covenant. We're not passive. We're not um, spectators to the covenant made between God and someone else, we partake of the covenant. So much so that his word, his body, his word, we feast on it. Blood, which is a life source of everybody, his blood becomes the life source, not here only, but in eternity. So we take the communion to commemorate the fact that the deal has been made. The covenant has been restored and God honors it. Thirdly, we, we take the communion as a badge of Christian profession. Yes, we, we're not just merely content with our confession, but we also want to profess that which we confess. We can confess that Jesus is Lord but in our profession, we not only become believers, we become doers. And we signify to everybody else in the congregation that I have allowed my body to be the temple of the Holy Ghost. And in that moment of communion, my brothers and sisters, when we eat that bread and drink that wine, we are professing our deep and abiding conviction in the covenant that we too are children of the covenant. We are professing outwardly, inwardly, and upwardly that we are children of the covenant. We accept our profession as profound. Then we take communion as we will do in a moment to indicate and to promote the communion of believers with Christ. We are in communion, not only with Christ, but with one another. 
we are joint heirs together we are recipients of the promise and it's a moment of fellowship and communion that we can look at each other and say we are brothers and sisters who have communed at the table of the same heavenly father we're in fellowship and our communion is an act of utter kindness extreme kindness and generosity we receive it first from Christ the benefit of the blood, of the blood and the body but also we express it outwardly to each other and then it is to represent the mutual communion of believers with each other you and I are in fellowship and communion not just with a church but in a church we are the body of baptized believers and so if you look at two verses again very quickly look first at verse 24 and imagine that our Lord has just been told that there is a tremendous plot and there was a plot that there was a tremendous plot taken foot and that many of late had sought to kill him not because of anything he'd done wrong but because of all the good he'd done the disciples must be kind of leery and um, he'd already done enough my brothers and sisters he'd done enough in their eyes but it was not yet the purpose for which God sent him to this earth he had to go a little bit further so he sat down at the table look at verse 23 and this is Paul recounting what took place that day Paul says for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you in the background of all that had happened in the foreground of what is to come Christ would not leave this earth without having first fulfilled his great purpose for coming the Lord Jesus that same night in which he was betrayed he took the bread and when he had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me Calvary had not yet come. The master is demonstrating a prophetic understanding of the will of God in his life. For at Calvary he will suffer a tremendous death. For he does not go to Calvary as a victim. He goes as a willing participant. He said himself, no man taketh my life. I lay it down freely. He could have called down thought. But he had to go a little bit further. And so the same night in which the Prince of Glory had been betrayed. The same night in which people sitting next to him would deny him. I mean, the same night when one of them would tell the soldiers, I don't even know the man. The same night when the rest of them would run up into the upper room and hide for fear, he stops and punctuates his destiny to the cross and says, take, eat of me. Verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body. It is broken for you everything that I will endure beyond these last 24 hours. It is for you. And I want you to do it not out of a sense of obligation, not out of a, a simplistic ritual. Don't just do it mindlessly, but when you take this bread, do it in remembrance of me. Think of the tremendous sacrifice made for you, for you. Think of the covenant that my Heavenly Father sent me here to seal, not with ink, but with blood. Remember me, is what he's saying. 17th Street when we 
when we take his body and we eat, all he asks, remember me. Verse 25, after the same manner, also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the new testament in my blood. Hallelujah. This do ye, as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. No matter what we think about, no matter who we think about, when we take the Lord's Supper, all he asks is that we do it in remembrance of him. As I told you in the Old Testament, he took the sacrifice of bulls and goats no more. Now it is the blood of Jesus and without the shedding of blood there could be no remission of sin. Can you imagine what it must be like to know that you were born in glory fitted in eternity robed in perfect righteousness and yet have to die a painful death on a cross willingly voluntarily and in 2021, 2021 years later, all you ask is that the recipients of that sacrifice do it in remembrance of the one who gave it all. Paul concludes in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. We take the communion as a commemoration, not only of our Lord's death and passion, his death and his suffering, because he doesn't just die. We talk about the death and the passion, the passion and the death, not just the death of Christ, but the passion and the death. The passion is his suffering. That's where we get the word compassion, which means to stand in place of another. And his passion is the suffering he endured as he stood in our place. He suffered. That's the passion. Then he died. So when we take this communion, we are commemorating our Lord's passion and his death. Paul reminds us, don't eat and drink unworthily. In the early church, many were coming and eating and drinking for some of them. Uh, that would be the only meal that they would enjoy. And he points out that is for the wrong reason. And there is no evidence anywhere in the scriptures as to what kind of bread we ought to use. The Bible never mentions, not one place, not one time, what kind of bread. There is one reference. There is one reference as it comes to the drink. When Jesus says, I will no more drink of the fruit of the vine. So we get some indication about the drink, but not the bread. But what makes it all an act of grace is that those who take it, take it by faith with thanksgiving in their heart. My brothers and sisters, I pray to God that as you eat this bread and drink this wine, be grateful. Be truly grateful that you are the recipients of a covenant made in glory, sealed at Calvary by the blood of Jesus. And we are partakers in that covenant when we eat this bread and drink this wine, as we would do in just a moment. Think of the high cost, hallelujah. Think of the high cost of salvation, and then be glad that the debt has been paid. And Not much else we have to do, just take it by faith with thanksgiving in our hearts and remember Remember Jesus. Will you pray at me? Father in heaven, we thank you for your most blessed body and for your blood. We thank you for being a God who honors every promise you've ever made. You give us a sign that you are a keeper of the covenant. And God, I pray now that you will move aside any sin, anything that will cause anyone to eat or drink unworthily. Pray that you will confirm our faith and strengthen our hope. Clear up our testimony as you lead us to eternal life. Forgive us of any sin that we have committed by thought, word, and deed. 
I pray, God, we stand before you worthy to eat of your most blessed body and drink of your precious blood. And I pray that everybody who takes this bread and drinks this wine will be filled with your grace and your heavenly benediction. Seal us against the doom that is sure to come. I Conqueror. pray this prayer from Calvary. In the name of our Lord Amen. and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. commemorate our Lord's death and suffering. It is at the time when we are communed with him and in the fellowship of his suffering. It is at the time when we partake of his most blessed body and blood. Will you pray with me, Father, in Jesus' name. I pray that you will consecrate this bread and this wine and that you will fill us with your grace and your heavenly benediction. God, I pray that all those who will partake of this bread and this wine will be made sufficiently able to do so by your regenerating power. Oh God, I pray that none of us will eat or drink unworthily. Please move aside any stain, any sin, any impediment, anything that will cause us to eat or drink unworthily. Dear God in heaven, I pray right now that you will consecrate us, that we are able to partake of your most blessed body and blood. Consecrate it now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters, in the same night in which our Lord was betrayed, at that last supper, supper that he had with his disciples, as they as they sat around and, um, and they looked at him in amazement and they knew that their time with him would not be long. They knew that in just a little while he would be leaving, and, but he would not leave them without a comforter. But he instituted, he commanded a way that we could remember him perpetually, forever. And he told them, Inasmuch as you eat this bread and you drink this wine, you show forth, you commemorate my death and suffering until my coming again. So when we take the communion, it's not just a ritual. It's, just, it's not just an ordinance of the church. We are being wedded into his fellowship, the fellowship of suffering. Um, we are demonstrating to him our divine love for him, for the sacrifice that he made. And so we take it by faith. And in the same night, my brothers and sisters, the same night, in which our Lord was betrayed, after he'd given thanks, he took the bread and he, he blessed it and he broke it right there in their presence. And he said, this is my body, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sin. This too, in remembrance of me. Likewise, at the supper, he took the cup. After he'd given thanks, he blessed it and gave to each of his disciples, saying, This is my blood which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. This do in remembrance of me. And inasmuch as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we show forth, 
we commemorate his death and suffering until it's coming again. My friends, the body, the blood of Christ. Take it by faith with thanksgiving in your heart. Will you pray at me? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for all those who've partaken of your most blessed body and blood. I pray that you will fill them with your grace and your heavenly benediction. Oh God, I pray that having renewed our covenant in you, having demonstrated our deep love and passion for all that you've done, the sacrifice you made. I pray, oh God, now that we will walk in this affirmation of our faith, that we will walk and this firm assurance that we have been wedded to you. Oh God, I pray that you will be in us a perpetual memory, not just in our thoughts, but in our actions and in our deeds. And as we travel life's dangerous roads, as we encounter the Jericho experience, oh God, I pray that we will have the love, the compassion, the empathy, the sympathy that allowed your dear son Jesus to use as an example of how we ought to pattern our lives. We will encounter those who are wounded. We will encounter those who are hurting, those who've been taken advantage of, those who've been exploited. We will encounter them, oh God, I pray today that we will never pass by on the other side. I pray that we will take time to show mercy. Bless us, keep us, lift us, fill us. Do it all in Jesus' name. The Lord, we pray, amen.